So this is Palm Sunday and it's one of the great moments for Jesus showing what he is about. And showing is the key thing. He's not saying anything. You know, often we're doing sermons where we're analysing Jesus' words. Here we're not looking at, at words, we're looking at an action. And before I go into the action though, and how it gets interpreted, it's worth thinking how actions can mean something today. And it's not just about action, it's about uh, who's doing it and where you're doing it. And I was reminded of this about you know three or four weeks ago. It was just after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And what President Zelensky did was he did a sort of Twitter video explaining that he wasn't leaving Kiev. But it wasn't just what he said about that. It was where he said it. Because he, he got out his mobile phone and he filmed himself, not in like an office like this, which could be kind of anywhere. He went out into the main town square of Kiev and walked around that main town square. And by giving his word there, by being there in that place at that time, his actions were saying, I am not going to desert this country. I'm going to stay here. I don't care if there are Russian death squads or I may be afraid of Russian death squads which are out to get me. I'm still saying, staying here. And so, yes, he was saying something. He was giving a speech. But what was really the message came through from where he was standing and when he was standing at that time. So still we have um, in our experience times when people's actions are kind of more significant than the words. And on Palm Sunday, the key event, the key meaning of Palm Sunday is not so much anything Jesus says as an action. And it's a plan. He gets some of the disciples to get him to enter on the occult, the foal of a donkey. So he enters Jerusalem on a donkey. Even today, if you go to Jerusalem, you go to one of the main gates, these are kind of busy places. There are people going in and out. It would have been even busier at Passover. And interestingly, there would be probably another procession which would have come in. And that would have been the Roman soldiers. Because, of course, uh, Passover was a dangerous time. It's a time when people gathered, so there would have been extra security. So going through one of these gates, I don't know if it's the same one that Jesus brought in, would have been a battalion of Roman soldiers, maybe centurions on horseback, people looking pretty mighty, armoured up, ready to fight, ready to stop anyone who's messing around. Jesus comes in, and he comes in on a donkey. And... Uh, not only is this a donkey kind of the most unimpressive war horse, even today if you're thinking about it, you know, you're, not, you're going to be scared of someone on a black stallion, you're not going to be scared of someone on a donkey. But he's actually picking up a bit of Bible, um, and a bit of Bible from, from, the poet, uh, from the prophet Zechariah, which they would have known, you know, we need it pointed out. So I'll just read out to it. The, the key verse is, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. So we've got the link to Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass. So he comes in, and the rest of that prophecy is all about, um, oh, it's like the next verse, uh, the battle bow shall be cut off. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. It's all about bringing peace. And so Jesus is coming and he's saying, I'm here to bring peace. I am a king, but not of the world. Now the next thing is the confusion, and again I turn to Ukraine really for a sort of insight into the confusion. He's coming and saying he's a king, he wants to throw off the oppressor to establish a new kingdom. But when you are oppressed, it's hard not to feel violent towards your oppressor. It's one of the things I've noticed, you know I don't have a particular link to Ukraine, but in myself I get angry with the Russian army, and part of me wants to kind of them to be avenged on themselves. I want violence to be meted out on them for the violence they are meting out towards others. And that stirs up in you, even as I know that's not what Jesus is asking for. And there's nothing to be celebrated when a, a Russian tank gets mashed up and some poor Russian soldiers, you know, their mothers have to find out about their sons who've died. There's nothing glorious about that. But when I watch it, because my, my emotions are confused, because I so want Ukraine to prevail, to still be able to stand, that um, it's hard not to feel a bit violent. And I think this stirs the crowd up. And I think there, even as he's laying out a message of I'm a new kind of king, it's possible the crowd weren't accepting of that. And famously, part of the analysis of Judas is that Judas wants Jesus to be a military messiah, not a you know, spiritual one. 
And so, in a way, he brings on the confusion. The Romans have to get interested in this figure who is starting what looks like a kind of military campaign against him. So he's coming in, he's picking up a prophecy, he's showing with the cult that he's a prince of peace, not a king of domination. But it plugs into this debate where the violence is so strong that we can't really shake it out. And this kind of triggers off the events of Holy Week, which is what we're going to be finding out about in the next uh, seven days.